So there is an objective real world out there that we probe through our experiments and our observations. Um, it's an assumption. Energy is still something that's possessed by things. Um, energy doesn't, uh, uh, my famous, my favorite analogy is, is you go back to some of the earliest episodes of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. We have Captain James T. Kirk and Spock and Bones and the rest of them. Uh, every now and then, um, the, 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 the Star Trek crew, the Enterprise crew would, would have to deal with beings of pure energy. And I always, I always figured that what had happened was that they'd run out of budget for decent alien costumes for that episode. So the best they could do was produce an effect of a glowing yellow light or something. And these were beings of pure energy. Um, and, and, and I, so the, the question is, well, what, what would that mean? What would a being of pure energy look like? Um, energy is something that's possessed by something. The quantum story, quantum reality. Farewell to Reality, A Beginner's Guide to Reality. These are some of the books written by today's guest on Seekers Mind Talks, Jim Baggett. Jim has been a science communicator, a philosopher, and has authored over nine bestsellers looking at the quantum reality, which is the most basic form of reality of human understanding right now. Today's discussion dives deep just into that. There is tons of wisdom and today's episode might change the way you see reality. Don't miss it. You are watching Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast. Uh, so I had a question. What It's like when I look at this microphone, we call it a microphone. Whereas I can also call it plastic and metal composition. Whereas I can also label it as atoms that are vibrating in certain frequencies. I can also look at it as, as protons and electrons flowing about, floating about in space. I can also look at it as, as gluons coming up from a field. And strangely enough, I can also call this nothing in some sense. So what is the nature of reality with this? In our everyday life for quote-unquote useful, we see this as a microphone, but whereas all the definitions that I just told seems to be fitting in the picture. What are we missing here? Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that we're, we're actually m missing anything. Um, I, I think <laughs> the example that you're giving is an instance whereby uh, we use models. Now, yeah, I'm going to ask you to bear with me on this one, because when I say that you have an idea of a microphone, a model of a microphone, um, the relationship between that model and what you see as the tangible reality is very exact. So your model of a microphone is exactly like your experience of a microphone in the in in the real and what you experience as the real world. But it's a model, it's conjured in your mind. Um, you could say that it's a direct result of sensory perceptions that you have of the microphone. Uh, but you, you deal with it, you interact with it as a result of having this model in your head. And that allows you to interact with it in a constructive way. You can use it and you can broadcast yourself and all sorts of good things. And the same is then true of the chemical composition, the metals and the plastics and other things that make up the microphone. We have a model uh, which allows us to manipulate these materials, uh, temper them at a certain temperature, um, fold them, bend them, mold them into shape to create um, a, a microphone according to a prescribed model of what a microphone should do and what it should be. Um, and those are useful chemical uh, models that allow us to do various things. And I can continue to repeat that same logic until I get to the subatomic uh, quantum level, where our models run out, uh, arguably, uh, depending on, on where you're coming from, on what your philosophical pre-commitments are. But there's one argument that says our models simply run out um, and what we're left with is scrambling around 
for more familiar models that come from our more classical experience, um, models based on waves, models based on particles. And we have successfully conjured with these and we fuse them together in a way that's given us this theory called quantum mechanics. We're at, we're at the state now where quantum mechanics is, is, is no longer giving us something that is easily visualizable. It's no longer giving us something that we can manipulate in anything other really than mathematical terms in ways that look really, um, well, they are abstract uh, and they look really rather unsatisfying because all these manipulations seem to allow us to do is to calculate the probabilities for things to happen at the quantum level. And, and that sits uncomfortably with us because we don't normally deal with probabilities in, except in, stem, in terms of the statistics of many instances in the world that we directly experience. And so we wonder where these probabilities come from. And so we're on a loop. So everything you say is true, um, but we've run out at the quantum level of, of an exact model that allows us to manipulate it in anything other than a way that says that uh, we actually don't really understand what it is beneath this level, um, but we know how we can manipulate it. And then you have to ask, what's the purpose of science? Is the purpose of science to give us these algorithms so we can manipulate nature? Uh, or is it to give us insight and understanding into the true nature of reality? Well, and, and that's an interesting debate. I, I like to postulate that we should think just because we can and other animals not. And that is a boon and curse for humans at the same time. We are bound to look at things because we are we were designed that way. And what really gets me is that uh, what we, what I just told or what you just told is true. And for quote unquote useful, we see this as a microphone, but nobody wants to see it as the gluons or energy that is at the precipice of our current understanding. But that will make minds think. And why do we not want to see this as the purest form and what would rather attach it to the label that is giving the apparent reality? Well, I think if I've understood the question, your question correctly, um, again, it, it, this comes back to the, the, the question of, of the, the purpose of having these concepts, having these, these models. Um, um, I was once asked a question in, when I was an undergraduate student in Manchester, um, my lecturer, we were in a tutorial, my lecturer was asking, uh, as, as I studied chemistry, and, and, and chemists had this, uh, one model of chemical bonding was very simplistic, involving hooks and eyes, where one atom would latch on to another atom and form a chemical bond. And, and my lecturer was, was asking us, well, well what is, what's wrong with that picture? And I, I responded after thinking, but there's actually nothing wrong with it. It's as useful a model um, uh, until, and well, basically until it's not. Uh, when you start to want to become more descriptive or you want to explain something that's more subtle about the nature of the chemical bond, then the hook and eye model will no longer be satisfactory and you'll have to reach for something else. But for a lot of what you might want to do in terms of picturing chemical reactions or doing other things, uh, the hook and eye model is probably as good as as it needs to be. So, again, the whole point we don't think about the micro microphone in terms of its ultimate constituents is because it serves no real useful purpose. Mm -hmm. It works. You don't need to know about its gluon construction. You don't need to know about the quarks that are uh, forming protons and neutrons in atomic nuclei that form the atoms, which can either get together with electrons, bond together to form the materials of which the microphone is made. You don't need necessarily to know that. All you need to know is how to switch the damn thing on and how to speak into it. But then again, why are we looking at it? Is it just because we are bored apes? Um, I think uh, so. That that's a different question. So we are intrinsically curious um, beings, 
And we have this predilection for um, grand questions. Where did we come from? What is the universe made of? Where did the universe come from? And so on and so on. And these are just unavoidable facets of being human. Um, and so we get to understand, uh, we learn uh, what it is that atoms are made of, what the composition of the microphone is ultimately reducible to as a result of centuries of physical uh, exploration. Uh, but as I say, there comes a point of where much that that's very satisfying, we now know what atoms are made of, we now know what atomic nuclei are made of, we now think we understand where mass comes from, but don't ask the question, what is mass, because then you'll, you'll have uh, another half an hour discussion. Um, and, and so one of the interesting things that I found in studying and writing about physics for uh, 20 years or so um, is that we, the more we, we learn and we understand, um, the more we discover we don't understand about the ingredients that make up everything that we are and everything that we see. So um, it, as to the question as to whether there'll ever be an end, will we get to an ultimate answer? Or as Steven Weinberg wanted a final theory of everything, I think the very, very simple answer to that is no. Uh, I can't see it in. Uh, for as long as there's human ingenuity at play, and, and for as long as there's funding for massive particle colliders and instruments aboard satellites that allow us to study the cosmos, for as long as, as we can continue to do these things, we will continue to answer questions and solve puzzles, but only as a result will we then uncover more puzzles that, that we need more answers to. And so we, we go on. And uh, I don't know. I think sometimes you just have to accept that much as the destination is very attractive and interesting, the journey uh, is there to be enjoyed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking in that sense, we've been playing around with the current model of atoms where we are right now with the gluons for a couple of decades at least. Do you think science has at least hit a brick wall in some sense and we need to start looking at it in as some different manner altogether? Well, well I, I think I think whenever that question gets gets asked in a in a serious sense, it, it's often a precursor to some incredible scientific discovery that nobody had ever expected. A good example not so very long ago, I go back to about nineteen ninety eight was that in theories of cosmology, so the description and understanding of the nature of the universe, um, the Big Bang, uh, prevailing Big Bang model of the universe was, I think, um, well understood. It agreed quite well with um, what 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 um, uh, what forms the, the body of evidence in support of it, such as the cosmic background radiation. Um, and other things as well. Um, and then um, some puzzling results were discovered as we started to look further. We started to use, astronomers started to use uh, supernovae explosions as a way of looking at very, very distant galaxies. And we discovered that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. And the only way that could be easily understood in the context of the equations of general relativity that underpin the Big Bang theory of the universe is that there must be this thing called the cosmological constant that Einstein had, had, had inserted into his equations in 1917 and then promptly discarded when he found that it, it, it you know, the universe wasn't written that way. Well, except it is, and it was. So, um, and that turned cosmology upside down. So, when we think we are getting close to the end or we're running out of, of, of road, if I can use that metaphor, uh, in scientific terms, it's often a prelude to some dramatic discovery. Uh, I can say the same today about the results coming from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which seems to be uncovering distant, some of the most distant galaxies we've ever observed uh, that, that seem to be amazingly uh, large and, and, and well-formed. 
only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang was supposed to have happened. Um, and yet theories of inflationary Big Bang cosmology don't seem to be able to support such rapid formation of large-scale galaxies. You know, we are still toing and froing on, on whether these results are telling us what we think they're telling us. But again, don't underestimate the power of uh, science to be pushing back the frontiers and uncovering things that we didn't expect or hit us from, from left field um, uh, and, and, and prompt a whole you know, slew of, of, of activity, whether it's theory or more experiment or more observation. Uh, in particle physics, it's a little trickier because the Large Hadron Collider um, has revealed the existence of this thing called the Higgs boson uh, in 2012-2013, um, and there doesn't seem to be any further particles to discover, much to the disappointment of theorists who favoured theories like supersymmetry or superstring theory who had a whole slew of particles on their agenda that they would quite like to have discovered by now. Now, I don't know quite whether that really does mean we have to await the construction of an even bigger uh, collider. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult then to start justifying enormous expense when you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, when your argument is, well, there might be some of these things out here and, and we won't know until we look. That's okay if it's a few million dollars perhaps, but it's a few billion dollars, then it starts to become a, a, a proper debate you have to have with those responsible for managing the expenditure of a government uh, or several governments, uh, which is how CERN uh, you know, operates uh, its budget. So, uh, yeah, you know, but we are, we're, we're at this place. Let's not get too hung up about this. We're at this place because of the enormous success of high energy particle physics and cosmology over the years. And what we're having to learn is how to be, how to be much more patient. Uh, it might take a decade, two decades, 50 years before we get the next big, uh, breakthrough in our understanding of particle physics or cosmology. Uh, in the meantime, uh, yeah, let's go worry about something else. Let's worry about climate change or, uh, or, or you know, some other uh, calamity that might be about to befall planet Earth. Um, but uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that there are, that there, you know, that we, we, we haven't run out of road. What we're running out of is, is the will and the money to be able to finance the kinds of observations, the kinds of experiments that might allow us to go the extra mile along that road. Mm -hmm. But certainly if, if we try to zoom in to any atom or particle for that matter, there reaches a stage when we cannot actually measure it, but that's by definition science, right? You need to actually be able to measure it, observe it, but what happens when we reach a point when we can't actually do that? We, have we actually live, reached that limit? Well, I think I think if you're a, a theorist um, working in the early part of the 21st century um, and you're looking around to make an impact within the time frame of your career, uh, then um, accepting that you might wait 50 years for the next big breakthrough from the new particle collider that hasn't yet been built is, is probably not going to be very satisfying. So what we have seen uh, in theoretical physics communities around the world uh, is a dash towards um, string theory, not the only um, form of, um, it's not the only frontier, I would say, in theoretical physics. Uh, uh, of, of the type that I, I would say are chasing after what I think of as, as foundations. So for me, theories of space and time, of matter, energy, light, and the universe are foundational theories. They're the theories that, that underpin most everything else that we might want to construct on them and use them for. So quantum mechanics, general relativity, these are foundational theories. So if you're pushing... For the next advance in foundational theories, then the, the likelihood is that you've placed your bets and you're a string theorist, or you're working on loop quantum gravity or some such 
foundational theory, which is at the frontier. The difficulty you have is there's no, there's no empirical evidence that this is the right direction to be, to be going. Uh, one of my uh, favorite books on string theory, is, uh, unfortunately, I cannot now remember the author's name, much to my regret, but it's called Why String Theory? And there's a chapter. The chapter title listed in the contents is uh, Experimental Support for String Theory. You turn to that chapter, and the chapter is, consists actually only of a single sentence, and the sentence reads, there is no experimental support for string theory. And that's that's where we are. So you've got a lot of folks committing a lot of time and energy, um, intellectual energy, to a program that, that might be wrong. It might be the wrong direction. And that's, believe it or not, I, I'm actually okay with that for as long as these folks can get funding um, and that funding isn't coming at the cost of other useful things that we could do in theoretical physics or elsewhere. Where I, I get a little bit upset is when um, in particular popular science books and articles are written extolling the virtues of this theoretical structure. And, and claiming all sorts of things for it, like it is the way the universe works, when in fact there is no empirical evidence for but the, that it's that it's correct. So, um, and we've had quite a lot of hype over the years, perhaps not so prevalent today as it was, let's say, in the '90s uh, or early 2000s. But uh, I wrote a book called Farewell to Reality, which is effectively attempting to point out that, that this, this, you've got folks also trying to change the definition of science in a way that, that suits that program, uh, rather than acknowledging that you know, with science, even though we can't explain how it works, what it is, um, it's nevertheless been successful for I don't know, 400 years or something, and, and, and we mess with it at our peril. So, so detaching uh, the, the idea that you can confirm a theoretical direction by reference to other theory, uh, theory can confirm theory, um, it, it takes us to um, something that got labeled as post-empirical science, which of course is an oxymoron. So we, 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 we are at that stage, uh, that is happening. Um, there is the hype, uh, there is the attempt to change the definition of science to suit purposes, but I, I, in the end, these, these folks aren't, aren't going to be successful, in my opinion, and it's not because I've, I, I've pointed it out or others have pointed it out. It's because, in the end, a scientific community is a big immovable block. It's like turning an oil tanker at sea. If it turns at all, it'll turn only slowly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you have you thought about how consciousness comes into this picture altogether? Because um, I was yeah I was go. watching this I, I was watching this TED talk from this uh, neuroscientist Anil Seth and he made this one statement. Uh, it's like uh, we are constantly hallucinating all the time. It's just that when we agree upon our hallucinations, we call that reality. So in terms of so that that frankly made me sit up at night because there is a 50% chance now that all of this is just being imagined up in my head. Just last night I had a dream uh, and I woke up from the dream and it was a nightmare actually and in the dream I was actually thinking is this a dream and I was 100% convinced that it was not a dream and I was living in it and I was like, okay, I'm gonna be here now. And a and couple of minutes later, I just woke up. And how can I say it? So is the chance 50-50 that this is a hallucination and or there is an objective reality that we've actually talked about? Okay, so, so I mean, these are philosophical conundrums that have been around for centuries, of course, um, or, or even millennia. And there's 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 for me that there's there is actually a, a, a simple answer um no matter how much i hallucinate and no matter how much i dream um that i'm pretty convinced 
won't change empirical facts such as the contents of my bank account. Um, and 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 the reality that I'm going to face next morning when I've woken up and had some coffee and 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 got some focus. So, um, much that these are interesting questions to explore. Uh, it depends to a certain extent on the nature of your background and training. I trained as a scientist, so I'm pretty pragmatic about these things. Um, it's, but I would be the first to admit that those scientists that, op that adopt a, a realist position, a realist philosoph philosophy, what I tend to call a, a realist preconception. So there is an objective real world out there that we probe through our experiments and our observations. Um, it's an assumption. Hmm. But for me, it's a very, very good assumption. It's yeah. like the assumption that the microphone that we were talking about earlier um, is tangible. It has the properties that you think it has. Uh, when you flip the switch, it will be on. And when you speak, it will amplify and record your, your voice with, with the appropriate recording equipment. So again, um, we have this preconception, this preconceived idea of objective reality and where we can fall foul is by thinking that the images, the model that we create in our minds, um, has a, somehow a di and, and we express in mathematical terms, perhaps as part of some theory when it has literally a direct one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence with the reality that underpins that theory. And this is where I, the, the string theorists have, 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 have taken a step too far. So a lot of their, the, the concepts that they have, so uh, you, you, string theory is created in multiple dimensions, all of which are compactified in a very small mathematical manifold. Uh, and hidden away at at sub 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 atomic level, um, and yet without those hidden dimensions, then you know string theory kind of wouldn't work, and we wouldn't have the correspondence with the particles that we experience, and so on and so. On. But you, you that that's all very fine, but but that doesn't mean those hidden dimensions really exist. So I can concoct any manner of theories. Um, I can hallucinate, uh, if you like, uh, uh, on paper. I can hallucinate a universe, uh, but that doesn't mean to say that it corresponds with uh, what I'm going to experience when I make an objective assessment in the laboratory or with a telescope. So um, th th we have to be cautious, but generally speaking, you'll find scientists are pretty pragmatic folk uh, they have no issue. They don't even think uh, uh, that they are adopting a philosophical position. Many, in fact, find philosophy unattractive. They think it's a waste of time having a philosophical discussion without realizing that without a philosophical perspective, they wouldn't be able to do science. But that's, hey, that's people for you. So you adopt a philosophical perspective, a realist position for the most part. There are some scientists that are, are more aware of, of the philosophy and the basis for their assumptions. But most go about their day-to-day -day work just assuming what they're dealing with is real. And why wouldn't you? You know, When you poke a chemical reaction in this way, you get this result, you come back to the lab and you do it again, and it, gets this, it, give, it gives you the same answer. So why wouldn't you assume you're doing something real and tangible? Yeah, it's a, it's a good way to play around with what we experience most of the time or what we are more familiar with. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay. So, but do do you think like philosophy has no role in going around with science hand in hand with science? No, not at all. I I can I I I I hope I wish more and more scientists would become more and more aware of of philosophy and the philosophy of science in particular. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, and it's there's not there's not an instant reward for doing that. I personally became interested in the philosophy of science because. Because of, of this, this business, my, my discomfort with what I was reading sometimes about the claims of modern theoretical physics like string theory or multiverse theories. And, and I said, this, uh, this, this, this is wrong. And, and potentially dangerous because much that this stuff is entertaining, 
um, and and encourages clicks and views and purchases or whatever. The fact of the matter is, again, it, it, there's no empirical foundation for it, and therefore that doesn't mean say it's not true, but what it does mean is it's not in any way proven or not likely to be proved any time soon. And I, I just sense that there was some dishonesty here, um, that folks were claiming some things for these theories that, that, that a little bit more honesty would have said, well, it might be, or it could be, or, you know, it, this is an interesting thing, but it, it might not be true. That I would have found more acceptable, but that's not quite the way they were selling their program. Um, and so I became more and more interested. I've been interested in the philosophy of science since um, I'd become an undergraduate student. And I've read a lot about the philosophy of science since then. And, and if you do that, you, you'll find it's, it's not very rewarding in the sense that despite um, centuries of the philosophy of science, certainly advances in the philosophy of science over the last hundred years or so, despite all of that, there is today no consensus, for example, on what science is. No. That's a tad disappointing. Well, what it means in practical terms is that there is no, what's known as demarcation. If we point to something like astrology and say, well, that's not science, that's just stuff that's made up, um, you'd, that's a demarcation criteria. And, and you have to then to say what it is about astrology as opposed to astronomy that makes astronomy science and astrology not. And the, the difference is where you draw the line, the demarcation line. Um, and philosophers have nagged away at this problem for a long time. Karl Popper famously came up with his principle of falsifiability. Uh, Thomas Kuhn famously came up with um, a notion um, of a paradigm um, and how paradigms shift in a scientific revolution and all that good stuff. But today, modern philosophers of science, generally speaking, um, have no view or, or we, I've pushed a few of them to try and give me a view, but they, they're, they're discouraged, in fact, from claiming to have solved the problem. And they can't point to a demarcation line to say, okay, well, that stuff's science and that stuff's definitely not science. It's fuzzy. And that's okay so long as you understand that it's fuzzy and you understand the reasons why it's fuzzy and uh that still doesn't that doesn't mean to say that you can't make uh well you can't have an opinion you can't have an opinion about string theory or ultiverse theory and claims that these are borderline not scientific uh, because that's no longer the point anymore for some theories there's not even an interest among theorists in connecting these theories with, with what I think of as empirical reality, uh, connecting them with observation or experiment. So it's a debate that's going on. I don't know how it will turn out. The voices uh, raised in this direction are few and far between. But generally speaking, um, uh, the momentum string theory may have lessened over the course of the last 10, 10 20 years or so. But it, it shows no sign of quiet uh, Papers are still being published. Lots of people are still working on the problem. And um, and kind of good luck to them. But just don't claim things for it that aren't true. Uh, that, that's actually a double-edged sword, right? Because the moment you define something, it is actually hit a brick wall. And uh, actually being open or otherwise, like if you look at our religious beliefs, it's all fully defined. There is no progress to it to speak in some sense. And when you live it open-ended, uh, it's always bound to criticism. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's no there's no received text for science. I'm afraid uh, there's no there's no bunch of scholars tucked away at various universities, reading the good book and trying to work out you know what what it is that science means or how to interpret what's scientific and what's not scientific. So we, we, we're left uh, with, uh, in fact, I, I've come to the, the view that what we have to rely on are institutions. So science is effectively defined by how it's done. And how it's done in the modern world is through institutions. It's through funding mechanisms. It's through all of these things, peer-reviewed papers in academic periodicals. Um, and and, and this, is, this is how science is done. At the moment, there, there are no barriers 
uh, within those institutions to stop lots of really rather um, non-scientific stuff being published in the name of what is, I think, probably a uh, uh, probably still more of a, a fad or fashion than 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 a, a program that end with any real hope that someday it will make a breakthrough. I could be wrong. However, um, I think the day will come, uh, I suspect, alas, um, there's a, a famous saying, I think, credited to Max Planck, the German physicist, uh, that um, certain scientific theories survive as long as their main protagonists. So there's a sense in which some of the leading lights of, of string theory, when they pass away from this world, they're, 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 the interest in the theory program, if it's still where it is today, might start to wane a little. We'll have to wait and see. Wow, wow. Switching gears a little bit here. Uh, well, I was... But that's, that. yes, I'm happy to switch gears, but I just leave you with the thought that what's, what's then of interest is not so much even the philosophy of science, it's the sociology of science and the sociology of the scientific community. Uh, you can trace a lot of what's gone on in science history down to the sociology of the community of people that were involved at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, like, so I want to switch gears a little bit and I, I really wanted to talk about mass that you defined earlier. And I, I was watching a lecture from yours and ultimately when you look at into the mass, it is pure energy. So I wanted to ask you the question, like, how do you view energy now? Like, is it nothing? Is it something? How can something come from nothing? Um, I, I'm, I'm possibly not best placed to, to, to answer that question except somewhat speculatively. For, for me, um, energy is still something that's possessed by things. Um, energy doesn't... Uh, I, I, my famous... My favorite analogy is, is you go back to some of the earliest episodes of Star Trek. Where mm -hmm. We have Captain James T. Kirk and Spock and Bones and the rest of them. Uh, every now and then, um, the, 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 the Star Trek crew, the Enterprise crew, would, would have to deal with beings of pure energy. And I always, I always figured that what had happened was that they'd run out of budget for decent alien costumes for that episode. So the best they could do was produce an effect of a glowing yellow light or something. And these were beings of pure energy. Um, and 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 I. So the, the question is, well, what what would that mean? What would a being of pure energy look like? Um, energy is something that's possessed by something. Um, a tennis ball has energy when it's hit in a in a in a in a service uh, on a tennis court at hundred I don't know how many thousand uh, hundred thirty kilometers per hour or whatever the speed uh, the the record speed is for a service. Um, electrons possess energy by virtue of their motion, um, and uh, and so. Um, when you, you come down to the, the point that I say you reduce mass to energy, energy is still something that's being possessed by something or it's being caused by an interaction between things. And in the case of the mass, the, the book Mass traces our understanding of the nature of mass right down to uh, interactions going on within, within protons and neutrons inside an atomic nucleus. So we have a system of quarks and gluons. Um, the quarks define the nature of the particle. Uh, two up quarks and a down quark make a proton. Two down quarks and an up quark make a neutron. Um, and these sit reasonably um, uncomfortably against each other, tethered by massless gluons, which carry a lot of energy. And the force that binds the uh, quarks together inside protons and neutrons is not like the force of electromagnetism or gravity, because that's a force that tends to fade with distance as I pull things away. If I were to pull planet Earth out of orbit, uh, the effect of the gravitational attraction of the sun would diminish um, as, as I pulled it further and further out of the solar system. The same with an electron from an atom. 
But the force, the strong force that holds, or the color force that holds the quarks together and binds them up with gluons, is of a different kind. There, if I pull pull the the, the particles apart, the 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 the, the force lessens. So it's strongest. It's like a spring. It's strongest when when the things are bound close together. Now it's the energy of those interactions that that is responsible for adding up to what we call the mass of the proton or the neutron. And these are determinations that have been done using quantum chromodynamics, a field theory describing the nature of these particles and the forces between them. Um, which requires you know supercomputers to 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 complete these calculations because it's a very very complex high density uh, type uh, calculation and um, but but nonetheless this is energy that's between the things not energy in its purest form we're not yet that Star Trek's beings of pure energy mm-hmm. I don't know if that answers your question but I've got- like have have you ever thought like how and so there's this energy floating around us right now. And at one point, this this energy right here decides, okay, I'll become a microphone. Uh, how does it evolve, so to speak? Well, again, again, I, um, a challenge to, to think of in those terms, the, the, the pragmatic scientist in me would say, well, okay, well, yeah, you're again back to this no- notion of, of, of nesting uh, of, of, of the models, so uh, you've got this this energy um, going on inside a proton or a neutron, uh, and that's responsible for when we measure the mass of a proton. What we're measuring is the energy of the quark gluon uh, combination inside. Now that energy leaks, that force leaks, uh, and and is what holds protons and neutrons together inside an atomic nucleus, but it doesn't leak beyond the nucleus so it's a different force that holds an electron in orbit around an atomic nucleus and the electromagnetic force works as i've said like we tend to think of a force if you pull the electron out of orbit then then it it, it, the, the force between the nucleus and the electron weakens so these these are descriptions that that belong at different levels of substance. Mm-hmm. So this notion of energy deriving from the color force belongs inside the nucleus and not outside the nucleus. The electromagnetic energy of an electron, well, we know electromagnetism, we can form electrons into almost um, a, a beam uh, we can push them down wires and, and create electricity. We can do all sorts of things. So the force of electromagnetism is very familiar, although we might not think about it very much from day to day. Um, and and so the materials in your microphone will rely more on an electromagnetic force, bonding atoms together to form molecules, bonding molecules together to form polymers, bonding atoms in a lattice to form metals, so again, you've got the description of the different layers of substance. Um, and so your microphone is a tangible thing. It ain't going to dissolve into some kind of quark gluon soup because the force that we were talking about holding the quarks and the gluons together works only inside the atomic nucleus and has no real role outside of that. So, you know, short of putting it in a furnace and raising its temperature and melting the damn thing, it's going to hold together pretty well. Mm-hmm. At, but you were also talking in, in layers about the emergent properties that are being exposed in different, or the complexities, so to say. But ultimately, fundamentally, in a reductionist approach, it's one and of the same thing, but the labels exist only in our head, right? It's it's our brains are defined that way in some manner, but fundamentally, it's it's the most constituent particle that you can think of. I don't know if I'm missing something out here, or I'm wrong. Well, well and and so it's it's a it's a misconception to think that reductionism means that everything then gets described only by its lowest form. 
So, um, and and that you stop and think about that for a while. That that is, it, it, there's a reason why uh, that's a misconception because it's something that not too many scientists even openly admit. I mean, why study high energy particle physics? Well, you want to know the fundamental nature of things. Okay, well then, does that tell us the fundamental nature of everything? No. No, it, you you can't you can't use quantum mechanics to describe certain aspects of bulk materials very easily. Even to use theories of quantum chromodynamics to work out what's going on inside a proton or a neutron requires a supercomputer and lots of financing for time on that computer. So so these things you're not immediately going to translate everything into a description based on quarks and gluons. And electrons. Much that the high energy theorists would would say, well, that's what it's all about. But in actual fact, much of everyday scientific activity is about stuff that's not down at that level. It's up at the more familiar level, uh, the level on which, in fact, Newton's theories of mechanics are perfectly respectable and adequate and will do the job, even though we know they're not quite right. There's relativity and there's quantum mechanics. So, so, so generally speaking, um, when we when we push the frontiers, quite often what that means is that we push the frontiers in directions that are starting to become more and more removed from our everyday experience. Um, we we push the frontiers. Relativity pushed pushed our frontiers to 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 vast speeds. When we're dealing with ordinary speeds, your your motor car on the freeway on a Saturday afternoon, uh, you don't need relativity to to work out the mechanics of that motion. Um, where you do need relativity to work out the mechanics of motion is when an electron is accelerated at, at speeds close to that of light. The protons in the Large Hadron Collider that are smashed together are moving at near the speed of light when they hit each other. Then you need relativity. It's extremes. The same with quantum mechanics. You need quantum mechanics and quantum field theories to describe the ultimate smallest ingredients of things as far as our understanding takes us. Uh, but you don't need quantum mechanics to describe much of everyday materials. You don't need them to build a bridge. You don't need quantum mechanics to build a bridge or a building. Um, so. So this this idea that, that pushing the frontiers down to the very smallest means that then everything must be based on that on that description is is clearly false. Um, we we uh, and in fact we, we very very find it very difficult sometimes to even explain the next level up on the basis of the theory that belongs down below. And um, as a good friend of mine. Uh, George Ellis, who's working on a book at the moment about the nature of emergence, how how we have to settle for the fact that uh, things, in, including biology, uh, are emergent properties that we might not necessarily be able to describe on the basis of what's going on at the level below, but we have to deal with in terms of the theories used and uh, developed to articulate what we understand about the level at, at that point. So so what we end up with is, is a, just as I've said, you've got this model of the microphone and the materials and the molecular composition and the atomic composition and the subatomic composition. We've got lots of different theories and ideas and concepts to describe what's happening at those different levels. You, you don't abandon them all and try to describe everything from the bottom up. You keep mm -hmm. what you, you keep theories of the different layers. And for as long as they're useful and they work, then you wouldn't change them. Mm -hmm. So you you were talking about your friend writing the book about emergence as life as being a property that popped out, and it might have been difficult to predict. Do do you see these emergent properties in some level at least as as magic? Then, no, not 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 as magic. I mean, uh, who was who was it that said um, uh, you know? Um, magic is just science that, that hasn't caught up yet, or something. I, I can't remember. It's Arthur C. Clarke, I think, but I haven't got the I haven't got the uh, quote right. Um, um, I, I I don't believe that there is anything that isn't amenable 
to a scientific explanation. That might make, make me a little dull. Not very much fun at parties if we're having discussions about spirits and supernatural things. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I am reasonably convinced that even the weirdest, most baffling situation um, will have a scientific explanation somewhere. <coughs> um, and uh, uh, it, it might take some uncovering, it might take some digging, it might be a puzzle, but generally speaking, um, science is, after all, the exercise of rational thinking and critical thinking and, and a degree of skepticism. So if you see something that's, that's unusual and can't possibly happen, then uh, be a little skeptical about it. Say, okay, well, if that can't possibly happen, how is it happening? Uh, mm -hmm. Chat before you'll, you'll get to an answer. Uh, I, I was listening to one of your talks and I uh, got this sentence that you said, like we are all slaves to our senses. In some sense, we can only view the reality which our sense organs are throwing at us. And yeah. if we can imagine an alien having n plus one sense than us like it might have a different sense organ than us science to it might be completely entirely different because it's viewing reality in a completely different way at that point our rational and their rational might be different yes you, you don't need an alien um you can find many creatures on earth uh with <laughs> with with um a, 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 a sensory dimension that you can't possibly comprehend a good one is 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 bat is a bat that mm. uses echolocation, so bouncing mm. sound off the walls of a cave or whatever to sense where objects are and where things are. I mean, you know how wow! Imagine being able to do that. Um, we think it's quite remarkable when we go out on a warm day and and the sun's in the sky and and everything is a splash of color, um, and 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 no doubt a, a bat would similarly be unable to comprehend uh, seeing the world through uh, the visible spectrum uh, as opposed to some kind of sonic spectrum but um, we, we are uh, I think with with science what we're we're able to do however is um, transcend that set of sensory perceptions um, through the design of observing instruments, through the design of experiments, and obviously through the development of ideas, concepts, theories that describe what we're seeing, and uh, allows us to escape a little bit from uh, our sensory world, the, pris the, uh, the Plato's um, prisoner in the cave kind of scenario. Now, um, I'm would go back to my earlier statement then that if you design an instrument you would make an observation you do an experiment then then you are necessarily uh, assuming the reality of the object that you're studying and and that it exists independently of you and and therefore what you're observing is the thing rather than something that you've just conjured in your mind because you've chosen to look in a specific kind of way so uh, we, whilst we can transcend our senses, I think we should always be aware as scientists that we are still making assumptions about the things that we see. Now, there are good assumptions and there are bad assumptions, and the assumption of an objective reality is, I think, a pretty good assumption, nevertheless. You also talk about social reality and uh, you, you were talking about how the matrix influenced our collective conscious in some level. After all these years of science communicating and science teaching and uh, diving deep, what is your social reality now? Well, I think, I think again, um, what, 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 I've, what I've come to um, understand, I think, is the fact that you you cannot go about the practice of science in the abstract. So mm. so what I what I tend to think of as empirical reality, the objective reality, the physical world that exists independently of, of us, of me, um, uh, and independently of of laboratory instruments that I can design and build and and so on and so on. 
So the world out there is the is the physical world, um, and arguably the physical world will continue to exist whether the inhabitants of Earth um, survive tomorrow. What won't survive beyond tomorrow are human institutions, because we create those, we build those. Mm. And what you then see is that overriding um, our study of the objective world is an entirely created human world based on institutions that organize the funding, uh, build universities, build laboratories, build telescopes, and all of these other great things. So the object of the study is objective, but the instruments and the mechanisms and the institutions that we use to do all of this science are entirely fabricated by the human mind. Mm. And would cease to exist if humans were eradicated from planet Earth tomorrow. There would be no universities. There would be no uh, National Science Foundation. There would be none of, of, of these things. They would, they would literally, the, but the structures would still be there because that's physical. But the institutions obviously would no longer operate because they operate through human activity. So it's bringing these together, understanding the nature of social reality. I, 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 was, I, I got caught up with the work of an American philosopher, uh, John Searle, and his theories of social reality, which are ap actually quite fascinating. The reality of money in, in, in the abstract is something that's really fun to contemplate because, you know, we, we, we tend to run our lives by it. Uh, but generally speaking, the cash you carry around in your wallet uh, is, has notes with inks uh, that uh, allow you to tell a $20 note from a $10 note and so on. But I can tell you that those notes, in terms of the value of the paper and the value of the ink, they're not worth $20 or $10. Only the institutions created by humans, like the Federal Reserve in the U.S., uh, are able to say, well, yes, we, we, we dictate that that is worth $20. If you exchange it in a store for guns to that value, and then you can expect to be able to have a transaction that will complete each each bank note is a testament of human trust and we hope that nobody is making use of that <laughs> well uh, yeah i mean you get counterfeits all the time and 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 then the federal reserve has to be ingenious in working out how it will defeat counterfeiting and and and, and so that goes on but but the, the whole the whole point is that that and and i use this analogy and I, I wrote a book called the beginner's guide to reality some years ago now and uh and uh, it, it um it, 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 uh, John Searle's theories were a source of great inspiration for writing that book. So I, I wanted to go through different layers. I wanted to start with our understanding of social reality, the reality that we create uh, just by being here on Earth, uh, then to the, the physical reality that scientists or science explores, um, and then further into what um, quantum mechanics, as an example, was trying to tell us about the nature of reality and the fact that we were really not, not getting any further forward. Uh, there's a section in the middle as well as classical modern philosophers from Descartes through to, <coughs> through to Hume and Locke and, and, and others, um, their speculations of the nature of reality as well. So it, it was really just a, a kind of fun exploration using lots of references to aspects of modern culture like movies. Uh, just exploring our, our understanding of the nature of reality from society all the way down to quarks and gluons. Has that has the idea of time fascinated you deeply in some manner? Yes, yes. Uh, if only in the sense that there's been um, a, an awful lot of discussion um, about the nature of time. Um, one of the things that I think is is actually good to um, think about is one of the outstanding challenges for what I, again I, I call foundational theoretical physics is the bringing together of what's known as the standard model of particle physics. So these are three field theories of quarks and gluons of um, uh, 
the, the certain types of behaviors of um, uh, quarks uh, and their, uh, the fact that they undergo um, radioactive processes. So a, a down quark will turn into an up quark. And theories of electromagnetism. So um, these are organized in terms of the forces. So there's electromagnetic force, there's this thing called the weak force responsible for various types of radioactive decay. And then there's the strong force which holds the quarks and the gluons together. Outside of all that, you've got gravity. And, and gravity was arguably turned into something that was actually arguably not a force. But um, a curvature of space-time in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So time in the general theory of relativity is a malleable thing. Space-time itself, four-dimensional space-time, for example, can, can stretch and bend and fold and do all these crazy things. Um, but time in quantum mechanics, and therefore in the standard model of particle physics, is the old linear time of Newtonian mechanics. It's an axis on a graph. It goes from zero seconds to whatever the length of time you want to look at. So the nature of time itself, part of the incompatibility between the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics is, is I believe, this, this very, very different take on, on, on time. So theories that try, like string theory and loop quantum gravity, try to bring these two structures together. And, and it's proved to, to be not impossible, but very difficult. And also not yet uh, yielded uh, any kind of way to determine whether that's the right description or not. And arguably, again, gravity is a very, very weak force, uh, if we can think about it like that, uh, despite the fact that it holds the Earth in orbit around the sun. And when you fall uh, from a height, you know about it. So it seems like it's quite strong. But it's very, very weak compared to the force holding electrons inside atoms. It's much weaker compared to the force holding gluons and quarks together inside atomic nuclei. So um, bringing these things together has proved to be fundamentally very diffi difficult. And I think part of the reason is a fundamental different perspectives that they, these theories have about the nature of time. Uh, where we go with that um, and what that means for our understanding of time, I'm not best qualified to say. Uh, you have theorists like Carlo Rovelli who believe that um, time is actually an illusion um, and, and what's most important is, is changes in the con con conformation of space, creating the illusion of time. Um, his close colleague, Lee Smolin, thinks the opposite, so it's a source of disagreement between the two of them. Smolin uh, thinks actually time is the, is the thing and, and space is the illusion. So. Uh, and so we go on, but this is what I'm saying. One of the, the, the most fundamentally interesting aspects of theoretical physics is, is when it deals with foundations, our very understanding of the nature of space and time and matter and, and light and the universe. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are so used to this linear progression of time, right? Uh, and and I was I was listening to uh, Chris Langan. He apparently has the highest IQ in America recorded, and um, he was saying like he actually believe in his theory of everything. He actually believes in sort of afterlife, so to speak. And he's he actually thinks that when you go to that afterlife, time doesn't exist for you. So or, or everything is available to you in the same time if that means something at all <laughs> well there's there's a that there, there is a, a statement I, again i don't know who it's best attributed to it might actually be Einstein. that the time is just nature's way of stopping everything happening all at once that <laughs> there's a movie too that got the oscars recently right everything everywhere all at once that sort of blow blew my mind away <laughs> yeah. it kept me up for one night <laughs> yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, let's end it on a philosophical note. What is your meaning of life at this point? 
in time. <laughs> <laughs> so we, when you say we're going to end, you mean we're going to end you know, next Wednesday or, or Thursday? Or, or if I, you, we, could, we could talk forever about this question. I, I think a question like that has to have a context. Um, the, 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 the life, what does it mean for a life to be meaningful? Um, um, and there are any number of ways of of answering the question. In fact, there's a, there's a book I bought years ago, which I still have somewhere, which is filled with contributions from philosophers on their all sorts of different takes on the meaning of life. And let me tell you, there are different takes on the meaning of life. So firstly, we should conclude that there is no single answer to that question. For me, um, you have to come back to meaning in a way that possibly the, the Greeks would uh, would articulate it. Um, so what does it mean to lead a meaningful life? And we end up, I think, starting to have exploratory discussions about the nature of human happiness, um, around the nature of human contentment, um, around the sense of human achievement, um, and all within, nevertheless, uh, almost stoic um, assessment of one's own capabilities. So I, I might have a, a a desires or a, a, a wish to achieve something that is impossible for me to achieve. Well, that, that's not the way to human contentment or happiness. So as soon as one is old enough to understand one's own limitations and capabilities, um, it's important to have a meaningful life, to set objectives, to have things you want to achieve, to have things you want to do. And it's not entirely, of course, um, about the self. It's about those immediately around you and the kind of life, the kind of person you want to be for them. Uh, it might be a, a family, uh, it might be kids, it might be strangers, it might be anyone that you come into contact with on a daily basis. Um, how you live your life uh, it determines the nature of meaning for that life. And, and, and that comes, I think, back to the kind of person you want to be. So it's, it's self-determined. I, I had a guest on my show and he, he sort of told me like life is like a blank slate and you can paint whatever you want. Uh, I, 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 think, I, think, I think whatever I can, can, can lead to, uh, can quickly lead to a degree of, of unhappiness or lack of contentment. I think again, uh, with with age comes an understanding um, of of what, what your capabilities are. Now, however, that that's happened uh, as a result of lack of access, uh, perhaps to um, you know, uh, I didn't grow up in a particularly bookish family, uh, so my education had to wait until I got the opportunity, literally, to leave home and go to university. Um, and I could look back on that and saying, well, gosh, you know, if I'd had a, you know, different parents uh, that wanted to, were, you know, interested in encouraging my education at a much earlier age, who knows what I could have done? Who knows what I could have achieved? But there's no value. I can't, I can't change that. I can't control that. I, and that's not the route for me to contentment, to say, well, you know, what if, uh, what could things have been? The slate had already been drawn upon. And I think that's, that's the point that I would make. You get to a certain age and stage in your life, the sla the, there's no longer a blank slate. It's already been drawn upon. And, and your, 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 your challenge is to then make the best of, of, of what, what, what's given to you, what's on the slate or the hand you've been dealt or whatever metaphor you want to use. And... Uh, and again, that comes back to, you know, being, you know, the kind of person you want to be. Do you want to be a kind person? Do you want to be a person that brings happiness to other people? Um, and, uh, yeah, so so it, it's it's really down to the individual and their assessment of, of who they are and the person they want to be, I think. 
that's how you get meaning have you have you ever thought like what why what made you lead such a curious life that has inspired millions what really made you a curious being of course you, you, you i mean i i've been i've been fretting about the nature of quantum mechanics for 37 years now i worked it out I and mean, you can ask yourself a question at some stage why do i do that um i do it because it fascinates me it interests me um i do it because writing about it uh is 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 thoroughly enjoyable um and i learn a little more every time uh, i write another article or I write another book uh so uh that's 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 basically why i do it uh but i i wouldn't have got to that point without some training as a scientist so i trained at university got a degree um i went to oxford to study a phd and i then I became a university lecturer uh, at the university in the uk for five years before i i quit and <laughs> without that background and, and training then the, the interest the fascination um I, I think would have been much more difficult it would have been l- much less meaningful for me it was being teased with philosophical conundrums in quantum mechanics but with a background that allowed me with a slate if you like that had been drawn upon and then therefore enabled me to take the steps that allowed me personally to explore further, uh, which had I not had that background, I wouldn't have been able to do. So again, you, you take your, your circumstances, your, your life integrated up to a certain certain point. It might be a, a pathway which forks and you've got to choose, do you go left or you do go right? And uh, you, you, you try to make the best choice based on, on your understanding of yourself at the time. Looking so much deeply into stuff, have you had any point in life where you felt like nihilism is true? You thought what was true? Nihilism. Um, how I got now? I don't think I've ever got to to that that stage. No, um, mm-hmm. I'm 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 aware. I'm familiar uh, with um, the, the, those philosophies. They, they 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 tend to be identified with French philosophers from. At the middle of the last century, and uh, I can understand to a certain extent why someone having reached a critical stage in their life might look look at look at the future and 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 not be too enamoured of what they see there uh, when they gaze into their equivalent of a crystal ball, and and therefore might have negative thoughts um, about about it, you know what what life maybe means. Um, so existentialism, nihilism, um, I find no appeal in those because I'm not like the person, I think, at the end of the day. Wonderful, Jim. Uh, what what are you working on? What can we expect you from the future? You've inspired millions of people, by the way, by your mind works. Thank you for that. And what can we see from Jim? Uh, it's very kind of you to say millions. I think thousands is more accurate, but uh, <laughs> it's very kind. Um, so... I have a, a book just out, um, just published in the US called Quantum Drama, uh, Bohr, Einstein Debate and the Riddle of Entanglement. Uh, that was co-authored with a very esteemed science historian called John Heilbrot, who sadly passed away last November. So he wasn't able to see the book in its final uh, published form. Um, but I, I, I was really, really pleased to get the opportunity to collaborate with John because John is one of the few people, was one of the few people, I should say, on Earth who had actually met with the founders of quantum mechanics in the early 1960s and interviewed them. Uh, so he met Niels Bohr, he met Werner Heisenberg, he met Robert Oppenheimer uh, 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 in 1962. And so working with John was an opportunity uh, to write about the history, the historical development of quantum mechanics from Bohr-Einstein to the present day to the 2022 Nobel Prize, uh, in fact, which was awarded for work on aspects of quantum mechanics. Um, So that was just published in the States. um, And my next book um, is about the troubled history of the Hubble constant. That will be published, I think, sometime in 2025. Uh, I'm at that stage now where I'm going through editorial comments on the manuscript, and once I've got with those, it'll go back to the publisher, and it'll take about nine months, I think, to appear in print. So middle of next year, maybe. 
And if people are to reach you, they can get to you via your website. Yeah, contact me through my website. I do get a lot of requests for reading uh, some people who have got ideas about how you know, quantum mechanics is wrong and uh, this, this and that. I, I fear I, I tend not to reply to those. I probably should. But anyone who's genuinely interested and wants to ask me a question, they can be contacted through my website, jimbaggett.com. And uh, uh, if, if I have a moment, I, I, will, I will reply. Hope you all enjoyed today's episode with Jim Baggett diving deep into the nature of our reality if you did please do support us and do check out our other videos as well i'm your host raj signing off from the seekers mind talks the science and spiritual podcast